Hello and welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today we are starting with our first of regular webinars. And I hope to continue it every Saturday. And today's topic, as one of you had suggested through the channel, is subaltern studies and Pakistani historiography. Um, I will make sure that after today's webinar is over, I will add this either as a live session to the YouTube channel or as an edited volume. Now, the reason I think it is crucial to discuss subaltern studies within the context of Pakistani historiography, but also Pakistani cultural production is to you know, ask ourselves what kind of history officially is being taught in Pakistan. What kind of history is excluded from the national narratives and what are the implications for that? So if you are just joining us, thank you so much again for joining me here in this first of the regular webinars uh, on post-colonial space. So if you look at starting with the actual subaltern studies collective, which came from India, I mean, I'm holding right now at least 10 volumes, right, that they produced over the years. Now, the project itself was launched by Ranajit Guha and people like Partha Chatterjee and others, mostly leftist scholars or Marxist scholars, but it eventually also becomes a culturalist project and that's one of the critiques of it. But what they were dealing with, the original subaltern studies scholars, people like Ranajit Guha and others were first responding to two major things. One, the imperial nature of South Asian studies itself, right? South Asian studies traditionally focused on the mainstream narratives of independence struggles, of narratives told by the elite, national elite and international elite. And they were responding to that. And the project was of recovery. Recovery of what? Recovery of silenced histories, right? Silenced demographics. And people whose histories or whose views of the nation or national history were either excluded from national histories or marginalized or totally obliterated and silenced. So, um, Hi, Habib. Thank you so much for joining me. So I'll continue. Uh, now, the main thing um, to keep in mind then the project as subaltern studies within the Indian context, what they ended up doing in these 10 volumes was offering retrieved histories of silenced groups, histories that were not included in the mainstream Indian national narrative. So their argument was that the way Indian history is taught, narrated, recorded, and published is dominantly representative of the dominant class, of the dominant political parties, and that the whole purpose of the project then was to go and retrieve. So I mean, if you look at India, what are the silenced and subaltern constituencies? Of course, there are millions of Dalit citizens of India who traditionally have been even when they've been producing great works, they have been excluded from the pol political power, but also from the cultural uh, power within the mainstream Indian academic and cultural narrative. Similarly, there are the Adivasis, right? Hill tribes, all these people who are excluded from when people tell the history of rise of India on Indian independence. So if you look through these 10 volumes, and I highly recommend it, ask your library to get these. I mean, I have volume one in my hand, which was edited by Ranajit Guha himself. And uh, the essays included are one from Ranajit Guha, one from Partha Chatterjee, famous for his work, Nation and Its Fragments, uh, one by Shahid Amin, right? And it's on rural indebtedness, and a few other by some scholars. But if you look at these essays, all of them are trying to recover and articulate whatever histories may not have been recorded or if they were recorded, not privileged within Indian historiography. Uh, 
So what does the subaltern studies project end up doing? Like on one level, it complicates the national narrative and in a way enriches it, right? Enriches it by saying, okay, 1857, you want to talk about the rebellion? Well, what about you you talk about the Queen of Awadh and you know you talk about Rani of Jhansi and others, but what about Mullah of uh, you know Awadh? What about his rebellion? What about these people who are not included, even in the liberation narratives, they are not included, right? So it enriches Indian historiography because it makes available for Indians and for people who study South Asian studies these narratives that then give us a more complex view of Indian history, right? This is similar to what, and they eventually become post-structuralists, you know, they start as Marxists, similar to what Foucault calls the bruised knowledge or buried knowledge, which constantly is in opposition to the mainstream knowledge. And one purpose of the intellectual is to recover that silenced and bruised knowledge, right? And juxtapose it against the mainstream narrative. And in the end, what that will end up doing is it would end up shifting, right? Or at least disturbing the normative structure of the mainstream narrative. So that was the subaltern studies project in a nutshell. Of course, you know, you can read the whole 10 volumes or at least some excerpts from it and, and enrich yourself. Now thinking, keeping that in mind, and I'm hoping that some people from Pakistan have joined us, right? It's kind of hard for me to get a lot of my friends from Pakistan to join in these quixotic ventures, right? Uh, but I, four of you are here, so we already are a group. And Kainat, welcome here. I think you are the one who had suggested uh, this topic, and I think it was really an apt topic to start this series. Now, if you look at Pakistani historiography, and I already pre-apologize if I offend anyone, um, that is not my aim ever at all. So the Pakistani historiography before even we go into that history, it, it is imbued with a certain kind of cultural fragility. And what do I mean by that? That there is a certain kind of anxiety in Pakistani historiography. And there are material causes for that. The main material cause being that the idea of Pakistan had to be constructed, had to be articulated, had to be claimed, right? It was prompted, of course, by the fear of minoritization, but then it becomes political and the entire Pakistan movement and all. In the process of doing that, the Pakistani history, as it is being taught, right, it's being taught in two ways. One is the mandatory subject of Pakistan studies, right? And the other is history of subcontinent and within that history of Pakistan. In both those scenarios, the Pakistani historiography is imbued with this anxiety to keep the narrative of Pakistan stable, right? Now, since so much of Pakistani narrative depends on discursive practices of producing that narrative, right? What is Pakistan? That was the question that people used to ask of Mr. Jinnah. What do you mean by Pakistan? If you have read your Aisha Jalal, uh, you already know that one reason that he never really clearly articulated what he meant by Pakistan was because he didn't want to be pinned down, right? He was fighting two constituencies, right? That even is a mainstream narrative, right? But we'll go into that. So this anxiety, what it forces Pakistani historians to do is that instead of writing history, they end up, end up writing hagiography. Right, And when they write hagiographies, there are these larger than life figures who somehow like single-handedly moved the clock of history, right? And then history itself, its recording becomes predominantly Islamized. And, and there are, of course, psychological and material reasons for that. Of one reason, and as I explained in my first book, Constructing Pakistan, right? Like, Probably in my reading of Jinnah, he didn't want to, you know, establish an Islamic republic. His idea was to have a space safe enough for Muslims to be a majority. But Islam becomes the mobilizing ideology, 
right? And then retroactively, what we have we have made Islam the only narrative of Pakistani historiography. When we, when you do that, right? What is excluded then automatically? are all the minorities and their voices and their struggles for Pakistan, right? And that history doesn't exist. I mean, there is no recorded official history of how did the minor minorities participate in it? How did they support Mr. Jinnah, right? What was supposed to be their role historically according to Mr. Jinnah, even though in his speeches, you know, he obviously mentions that, that they will be equal citizens of Pakistan. So what ends up happening is that the dominant historiography of Pakistan then starts with Muhammad bin Qasim and Dibul ki Fatahat or Salahuddin, you are not Salahuddin, Mahmud of Ghazni attacking India like Solan the 16 times. And, and then that is also romanticized. I mean, why was he attacking India every year? I mean, obviously not to bring Islam to India. Islam was already coming to India through the works of Sufia and Olia, right? He was coming for plunder, right? But we have his, we have mythologized that history and somehow posited the history that Pakistanis claim as this history of constant warfare and valor and all that. So there is officially no subaltern studies project in Pakistan. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Not at the scale of subaltern studies collective in India. Okay, and there are material and, and ideological reasons for that. Ideological, I already mentioned, is the anxiety about national identity. An anxiety that the Indians, by and large, do not have to face on the dominant level because India has always been there. Pakistan had to be imagined, right, fought for and created as a separate nation. And in the process of doing so, the narrative needed to be developed. That narrative is the dominant narrative of Muslims, even though Mr. Jinnah himself, you know, was quite secular, right? Uh, the reason I think, and you can all put me wise, um, Okay, so let me go to Mudassar's comment. It says, I think this is the first time I'm listening about the subaltern history. It is considered taboo in Pakistan to talk about people's deliberate. Oh, yeah, of course, it is considered taboo. So what I'm trying to say here is, one, that there is no official subaltern historiography project in Pakistan. But I will remind you that there is subaltern historiography going on in Pakistan. So ideological reasons are already there. Material reasons are that the thought in Pakistan, critical thought in Pakistan, right, is controlled directly or indirectly coerced through different constituencies. Okay, some of them you already know. So people who are writing and thinking about Pakistan have to worry about what the Molvis are going to say, right? So that already tells you that there are certain territories of thought you cannot visit, not publicly at least. Nothing is for debate. And this comes from, an, uh, from a religious tradition, you know, which in 10th century was debating the nature of God. I, I have volumes of Al-Ghazali and Ibn Rushd right sitting on my desk where they're basically rationally talking about the possibility of existence of God, right? This is the tradition that so-called Muslims draw on. But in Pakistan, if you go slightly off the mark and say something slightly radical, chances are your life would be threatened. That's a fact. I'm not deriding Pakistan. I love Pakistan. But that's the kind of culture we have created. The others are your are institutions. I was part of one of them right, for 14 years of my life. These institutions also try to control how stories are told, how history is recorded, how people teach it, how people talk about it. So when you have so many implications to think about, right? And then institutional resources, would, they, would a university fund a project that says, I want to go and recover, you know, uh, the Christian narratives? No, no. I'm, I, so all these things then, where is the funding going to? Pakistan studies, right? Iqbaliyat, right? Which university, if you can name one, says, oh, we will fund a project that goes and studies, uh, you know, the culture of the 
dancing girls, right? Or, or the culture of, you know, uh, the trans people who are a living cultural entity within Pakistan, right? Which university will fund that? So institutionally, there is a bias against dominant history, right? And then there are different kinds of controls that force people to just follow the line and write and publish and teach within the prescribed narrative that is the national narrative. Now, I had mentioned that there are subaltern histories, okay? But they have been sidelined. I mean, if you go to Sindh and try to read in Sindhi, that's the next language I want to learn. There is rich tradition of leftist thought in Sindh. I mean, how many of you sitting in Punjab and elsewhere uh, know the name of Sobo Gyan Chandani? who just recently died, I think two years ago. Gyan Chandani was one of the leading Sindhi Marxist writers. People in the world know him, right? No one in Pakistan knows him other than in Sindh. How many of you know who Iqbal Masih was, right? What did he do? Like a 12 year old boy, right? Who fought for the rights of children who were in bonded labor. Right, who has a Wikipedia entry, but do we teach him in our schools? Right, that is your subaltern history. How many of us know who Rana Chandar Singh was? Right, one of the founding fathers of Pakistan People's Party. Right, um, or the Soda Rajputs of of Thar Parker. I mean, no, no one outside of Sindh knows that there is a sizable Hindu population in Sindh who considers themselves quintessentially Pakistani, that Sindh has had that tradition. You go to KPK and look at the writings of Bacha Khan, doc, you know, Dr. Khan Sahib and others, right? These are subaltern histories. These were people who were opposed to the creation of Pakistan for philosophical and political reasons, right? But we, we declared them traitors. We declared them Ghaddar, GM Sayyid, same. So the, the history, the subaltern histories do exist. It's just that they are not acknowledged by those who have the power to decide what would be Pakistan studies, right? And, and what does that do to Pakistani culture, right? It enervates it. It makes it weak, like less complex, more dependent on these grand narratives of religion. Now, the greatest example of silencing in Pakistan, and I will say it clearly and openly as a scholar, because at least that is my job, is the silencing of the Ahmadiyya community. Okay. Now, I have 14 volumes of uh, last seven years of the Raj sitting over there on my shelf. If you read through them, you will find out that the leaders of the Pakistan movement has had absolutely no qualms about taking the support from the Ahmadiyya leadership. There are letters of support for Pakistan written to the Viceroy, right? By the leadership of the Ahmadiyya community, they fought for Pakistan alongside Mr. Jinnah and others, right? But here is the irony and sad part of their existence in Pakistan. First of all, constitutionally, they are probably the only minority in the world. Even Indians have not done that, right, in their constitution, right? They're the only minority in the world that are declared a minority through a constitutional amendment, and then not given the rights of a minority, which are provided for minorities in the same constitution. So first of all, they have been sidelined silenced and then further space has been created within the constitution for their persecution right and i would say what was the moment and this is connected to this thought when imran khan for example lost my support i mean not that my support matters for him you know who am i was that i was watching one of his interviews on one of the islamic channels and someone asked him um, a question of aapke khayal mein Ahmadi ye yun yun hai? I mean, that was the question. And his answer was, as the leader of a political party that claims to be the most prominent political party in Pakistan right now, his answer was, Haan, wo Quran mein likha hai ke I mean, I heard it with my own ears. His answer as a national leader should have been, 
what difference does it make what their religion is what sect they what do they believe in they are pakistanis equal citizens of this country right now that would have been a way of looking at minorities which says no if you were born in pakistan or if you naturalized as a pakistan citizen it should absolutely not matter matter what your gender is what your regional identity is what your religion is what your religious sect is right because you and that should have been his answer Imran Khan's answer, the guy who eventually becomes the prime minister of our country and still is. If that's the level of his thought, right? What can we expect from people like you and me, you know, who have very small constituencies and just have our words to make a difference? So formally speaking, then there is no subaltern studies project in Pakistan. There are subaltern histories. There are subaltern cultures who articulate their life who talk about it, who write about it. The question is, are there enough of us who take that story, you know, and tell it, tell it alongside others? And I think that's where Pakistan absolutely lacks. Now, our poets and our writers used to tell these stories, right? Uh, I think you all are pretty young. We grew up in the time of you know, uh, you know, Parveen Shakir, Habib Jalib, Faz Ahmed Faz, Ahmed Faraz. These were the people who would speak on behalf of silenced minorities, on behalf of women, on behalf of regional minorities who were being suppressed, right? So overall, what all I have to say about then subaltern studies and Pakistani historiography is that not only that the subaltern studies are excluded in Pakistani historiography, Pakistani historiography itself, I mean, you can open a textbook if you have read uh, um, that famous book, Murder of History, right? Um, there are, I mean, open lies in our history books, which are taught to our young people. So what does that do? What kind of damage does it? They grow up thinking of history as truth, a knowledge that was biased, right? And that was not factually true. And when, then what kind of a humanity would that knowledge produce if we believe that education plays a role in constructing um, the kind of human subjects we are or we will become? So what is the tragedy in Pakistan in my own lifetime? Like, okay, look, when we grew up, we had Bengali friends, right? We had Ahmadi friends, we had Christian friends, right? Uh, we knew what a church is, what a mosque is, what a Jamaat Khana is, or what, what an Imam Barga is. All these things were part of our culture. Any young person growing up in Pakistan, it doesn't matter where you are, like if you're part of a minority, you have already internalized that you are somehow inferior, right? If you are part of a silenced minority like the Ahmadiyya, then you have to stay silent in Pakistan to just to rise in your profession. Uh, one of my former military friends once asked me, and you know, we were having a conversation and we were talking about this senior general and this guy asked me, do you think he's an Ahmadi? And I was like, I have no idea, man, right? And I practically do not care. But people do care about these things, right? So how do you construct a modern nation, a vibrant, tolerant nation, if your national narrative is based in that kind of exclusion? And it's not just like perfunctory. You know, before in 1995, slightly for a brief moment, you know, I had started following these religious scholars. I was trying to explore my religiosity to its extreme. And I started following Dr. Israr Ahmed and heard his lectures and all. And there is a moment he's trying to explain the rights of the minorities in one of his public lectures, right? I heard it with my own ears, right? And what is he saying? Urdu mein, right? What he says is, agar ye mein hai, to inko yaad rakhna chahiye ki ye chote hai. Or chote ban kar rahe. This is a religious scholar who claimed to know the mind of God. 
he was so proud of his erudition and his Arabic knowledge that he would claim they don't know anything because they don't know enough Arabic as if I mean really literally to know God you need to know Arabic I mean it's like how how are the Christians getting to know God they don't know any Latin and it wasn't that the Bible was written in Latin right it was in Aramaic no one speaks Aramaic but this is the guy right but what what are the ramifications of that when a person in that kind of symbolic power says something like that, it has the power to shape not just people's view of the minorities, people's way of looking at the minorities, but also their way of acting upon them, acting against them. So what kind of a culture can you develop then? A culture of intolerance, a culture of hatred, a culture in which people who are either in a minority position as an ethnic minority or a religious minority or a gender minority will constantly walk within the streets of your own culture perilously afraid, right? And what kind of a freedom and independence is that, right? Think of it this way, all these claims that these Molvis make about dominant Muslim identity in Pakistan, right? The same always want to build their mosques in Washington, D.C. and, you know, Carrollton. And, and here they want the rights of the majority. I, I, mean, I live in America, right? Imagine if someone told me, oh, you cannot have a mosque, right? Or you can't talk about your religion publicly. And I was like, how, how the hell can you say that? But the same people, when they're in their own dominant places, absolutely don't want the minorities to have any voice, right? So, the subaltern historiography does exist. People, journalists, poets have written about their lives, lives of the minorities, lives of women. The official history does not acknowledge that. The official history is based in half-truths, based in ideology. And I think the reason behind this is this deep anxiety about national identity, right? Um, I mean, what, how deep is that national identity? Like it entirely depends on a thing called two nation theory, right? What is two nation theory based in this half cooked ideas that Hindus and Muslims had irreconcilable differences and because they had irreconcilable differences, a separate country had to be created not realizing that despite those irreconcilable differences, a majority of them still live in India and they have the largest population of Muslims within a non-Muslim country. So when you put these things to question, they come to crisis. How do people grow? How do nations grow? By bringing their national narratives to crisis because only then they can develop new ones, more liberatory ones. I mean. Think of United States, it's not a perfect country. There's a lot of racism still going on. People in the streets are fighting for equal rights. But think of it, if United States had not rethought itself over and over, it would not be where it is right now, right? So the entire civil rights movement, before that, the abolitionist movement, the feminist movement, all of these movements were meant to interpret the first few words of the Constitution, we, the people, what would be included as fully realized human beings as we, the people in the US Constitution. And because there were challenges to that narrative, right, constantly and still are, the nation can continuously rethink itself. So the project of subaltern studies then, you know, if somehow officially or unofficially it is allowed to prosper in Pakistan would be first inclusion, inclusion of these silenced narratives from Balochistan, from Sindh, even from Punjab, right, and from KPK into the mainstream story of Pakistan. Two, establishing, establishing institutional spaces where, you know, people learn. And so Mudassir, your question, why should we teach because you live in a complex world, right? You, you you can't just have one dominant history and think people will not see through it. 
because then you're creating a nation of students who believe in these mythologies without acknowledging that there are other narratives, not necessarily in competition, but that augment. Acknowledging those narratives that pass as part of Pakistan will make Pakistan only stronger. Pakistan will be fragile if its narratives are fragile, right? So if the narratives are fragile, how do you keep them in place through force, through sanctioning, through fear, right? through telling people not to think certain things? The strongest nations on this planet, not militarily, but in their long-term sus sustenance and innovation are, are the nations that permit that kind of critical thinking, right? Um, if you look at Islamic history, the height of Islamic accomplishments is during the time of Harun al-Rashid and Mamun al-Rashid, right? And why is that? Because they were strong rulers or whatever, and the empire was big. But also, what was the leading philosophy of that time? Al-Mutadilla, right? The rationalist philosophers. The decline of Islam starts with the reactionary response from Tem Ibn Taymiyyah and others, the orthodoxy rising against Al-Mutadil, I'm not saying it's causal, but I'm saying it's related. So the decline of Islam starts with that, when rationalism is defeated by reactionary orthodoxy, led by uh, you know, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and then Ahmad bin Hanbal and others. And, and you can trace that history. So why should we teach it? Of course, because you want your young people to grow up in a complex world you want them to respect and acknowledge those who live with them, who might not be Muslim, who might not be Sunni, who might not be Punjabi, Sindhi. And the only way they will do that is if they learn about those cultures, if you know about, if they know about who, who are their neighbors, you know, who are the Hindus in Pakistan, who are the Sikhs in Pakistan, who are the Ahmadis in Pakistan. What struggles do women face historically and now? What was their role in the Pakistan movement? These are the histories that we need to teach. I mean, just think of the role of women. Right? I hear I'm on a lot of military forums, right? So there is a lot of hagiography of dictators, especially General Ayub Khan. Or Pakistan was strong and good during Ayub Khan's time. It's the same Ayub Khan, right, against whom Fatima Jinnah ran in the 1962 election. Now, do you all know what these people used to do, Ayub Khan ke jo chamche the? They would parade around in the streets a female dog, right? With a plate in her neck, which had Fatima Jinnah's name. And they will parade that dog around as Fatima Jinnah. And this is the sister of so-called qaid -e azam Our rulers did that to her. And the reason she entered politics was because she was opposed to a dictatorship, right? This is what we did to Fatima Jinnah, our leaders in our name. How many of us know that history? Right? Okay, um, Kainat, I'm drawing from Gramsci, Foucault, and the Subaltern Studies groups. Could you please recommend any authors from Pakistan who I can read or draw from? Uh, not off the cuff, but I think I can. I mean, Ahmad Ali, well, not Ahmad Ali. Uh, uh, all the Marxists, I mean, Iqbal Ahmad and others. Uh, but I will definitely later have a list for you from Pakistan. Um, and there are, there are quite a few, even within Pakistan, who have done that kind of work. Uh, there is a beautiful book by Kamran Astar Ali, Surk Salam. I think it's available in Pakistan. That is a history of Pakistani left. I would highly recommend that. And uh, right now I'm drawing a blank, but I will come up with it. So, I mean, the, the idea, a lot of people who are invested in the mainstream narrative of history of Pakistan would feel threatened if it's infused with the knowledge of the fringe, right? But because that narrative itself is mythological and is, you know, um, fragile, the only way to s strengthen it is to make it more inclusive. Uh, a few years ago, I think about eight years ago, I was writing about March 23rd. 
and there was a picture of the delegation there, right? The people who were on the stage when the Pakistan resolution was made. And there is a figure of a woman there, right? In, in full parda in black. And I started looking for her, any mention of her in our history or elsewhere, who was she? That's the question that I posed, right? And then one person from my readers actually pointed out to me, oh, this is who she was. But I, having gone through Pakistani educational system, didn't even know that on the stage in 1940, amongst all these men was also a woman, right? Who voted for the resolution, right? No one ever taught us that. That is, so if we include that, what damage can it do to Pakistan's history, right? Not much, but it can enrich, it can enable some young woman to think, actually, I mean, of course, women were participants in the Pakistan movement, but including their stories in it would make it a richer experience. So, I mean, these are some of my thoughts about Pakistani historiography. And these are the things I write about, things about I think about. But is there a need for such kind of work in Pakistan? Absolutely. And who will do that? I mean, it's like rephrasing John Crow Ransom, the task of liberating Pakistani historiography from these mythologies is the task of the scholars, right? Task of professors, you students of literature and history is to figure out how to tell the stories differently. And then if there is a pushback from the state institutions or you know, whatever powers that be, right? The more people write about these things and talk about these things, the less is the coercive power of any institution to control thought. In my personal humble opinion, Pakistan will not grow as a complex, diverse, animated culture unless its intellectuals are free to talk, unless its intellectuals don't just follow the party line, but write on the edge of thought, right? And write about things that matter and that may affect people's life, unless they have the courage to do that and an env environment in which they can do that. There is no way any nation on this planet can, can sustain itself through totally controlled narratives. You would then need a system like China where there's supposed to be a communist party which is deeply capitalistic and somehow they can keep the people under control. I don't think so, despite all the problems in Pakistan, our people will be ready for a system like China, right? Um, okay, so, I mean, yeah, so this is the beginning. Uh, let me share with you the next week's topic. Um, next week, same time, uh, we will be talking about globalization and in post-colonial studies. So the general idea of what my understanding of neoliberal globalization is and uh, how to use that knowledge in post-colonial studies. So that's what um, I'm planning to do next week. And of course, you are free to suggest any topics um, whenever I announce this through my website, postcolonial.net or through the YouTube channel whichever suits you the best. So this is all I have to say. I'm sorry it's not very comprehensive and it mostly came across as me complaining about Pakistani historiography, but you know, that's my opinion. You don't have to take it and you absolutely have the right to challenge my opinions, right? But I do encourage you to dare a little, you know, and, and write if you're writing your dissertations, if you're writing your thesis, don't just go for the safe path, right? Create knowledge that, you know, just write it in a way within your limitations where not many people in power will understand what you're actually saying, but something that is liberating and that speaks for the rights of those who are silenced. That was what I did my entire life when I lived in Pakistan, when I was in Pakistan army, despite the consequences. And that is what I do now as a scholar. And it doesn't take us far. We actually make more enemies than friends, but at least 
in the end, you know, when you die, you can tell yourself a better story, right? That I stood for something, that I didn't just live for myself. So these are some of my thoughts. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them and I'll try to answer them. If not, I will sign off in a few seconds and come back to you next week around the same time, 10 o'clock my time. Okay, Muhammad, what are the reasons or advantages of not telling an original history to Pakistani people? So I have two questions. What do you mean by original history, right? Uh, because, I mean, history, there is no history outside of text, right? History is textual. It's recorded in text. Someone records it. So history is motivated at both ends. Someone writes it. You have to take into account their politics, their lived conditions, what made them write a history. And then someone retrieves it and teaches it. So the politics, prejudices, and preferences of the person who retrieves it are part of it, right? Now, what can we do, since it is all textual, is to incorporate more text within any history mainstream that is being told. What are the advantages is, if we know more about the past and how it is constructed, it can enable us to understand the present better. And maybe it enables us to forge a better future. So think of it this way, if, if Pakistani high school students come up with this idea of a history in which they Muslims were always superior and Hindus were always inferior. And for 1,000 years, they lived as these two separate communities with no coincidences and no correspondences. All they think of Hindus is an, an essentialized view of them. So what would they think of Hindus who live in their own country then? Their views will be informed by that. Now, if we could have a richer history, which tells us no, I mean, yeah, there were wars between, you know, dominant Hindu groups and Muslim groups. But by and large, you know, in most Indian polities and states and nations, yeah, they were able to coexist together. The objective differences were there, but they were subjectivized by politics, right? So then we create a tolerant group of people, a group of people who can take difference and live with it and respect each other. Uh, let's not even go uh, to even Hindu-Muslim differences, the sectarian differences in Pakistan, right? We can either teach the history of Islam as a history of Islam that started as one interpretation and then bifurcated into different, and that it doesn't matter who you are as in the end of, by the, at the end of the day, if you follow the path of kindness and the path of the prophet, you're good enough as a Muslim, then we can create a tolerant subjectivity. But if same people only hear the history of Sunni Islam and within that of Mr. Abdul Wahab, right, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, then you're creating a human subjectivity that absolutely will see anyone else, even if they are Sunnis, as wajibul qatl, as this and that. So that's the difference in being exposed to more complex knowledge and being exposed to just literalist one interpretation of any history. Dr. Ajmal Saab, excellent. Okay. Will you please tell me about the recent trends in the historical writing? And uh, I, to be honest, not really, because I'm not a historian. Uh, I think you will be better. But my cursory reading of history, and that is what Oxford University Press produces, uh, is pretty much all the same hagiographic accounts of Pakistani history. I haven't seen, other than Haqqani's book that came from outside, something in Pakistani historiography that offers, you know, something deeply critical of official history. And that was the point of today's talk. And if you know of a text that has come out, um, you know, Please feel free to edge. What's your, how are the people from subaltern groups in Pakistan are recording? Good, Bapsi Sidwa. I don't think Bapsi Ji would qualify as a subaltern. I mean, she's a privileged middle class woman living in Houston. But yeah, I mean, in terms of her faith, she belonged to and does belong to a faction that is, uh, or a group that is a minority group. But 
yes, I mean, she tells a different kind of story, different from usual Pakistan. Uh, Sukhdev, so how non-textual, that's a very good question actually about non-textual evidence in subaltern studies. Uh, one thing, remember, non-textual evidence is still textual. If it is an oral story, it's a text, right? But uh, that was one critique of subaltern studies other than quite other critiques was that at the end of the day, these people who are retrieving subaltern histories are themselves bourgeois intellectuals, right? So what gives them the legitimacy to go and do that? Because the actual testimony should come from the subalterns themselves. So that's a really good point. So uh, a lot of, in the Latin American tradition, we call it the testimonial right, where uh, an intellectual or a scholar goes into a community and talks to the community, asks them to tell the stories, and then records those stories, right, word to word, and passes them on to a larger audience. So act of testimonial, you see that in the Indian context and partially also in the anthropological uh, studies in Pakistan as well. So, but the problem will remain that if, you know, those of us bourgeois intellectuals from a dominant group, we go and record these histories, how much of it is we ourselves and how much of it is the subaltern groups themselves. Uh, for me, I think I would like to at least settle for something where at least something is being done, right? Someone is actually going and talking to the subaltern groups, right? There is a young person, and this was to answer Dr. Ajmal, your question, about uh, historiography, there is a young person from Lahore, uh, from um, the art school in Lahore, I'm forgetting the exact name of it, uh, I'll recall it, who has gone and recorded uh, three video projects, right? Uh, three film length videos, uh, who has gone and recorded because he was raised by uh, a transgen by the transgender community. Right? And he has gone and recorded the stories of these transgender gender mothers that he had as a child. And they, in those videos, they tell their own story. Now that is subaltern historiography, right? Because this is a marginalized of marginalized groups in Pakistan. And this young man who now is successful, he's studying at NCA, National College of Arts, but as a scholar and a student, where is he going to go and recover, right? The history of his own people, people who raised him. And through that act then, what does it does? It humanizes for a non-transgender audience, the life of transgender people, right? And it also tells them, this is how this constituency lives, right? That is an act of subaltern retrieval and then using a modern medium to represent it to a larger audience. Now, ideally speaking, the subalterns themselves should be able to come and take the stage and tell their stories, but at least we have this much right through an intermediary who is writing in solidarity. So that was also the subaltern studies project. Okay, so I thought to conclude it, but there are more questions coming in. Uh, so, Dr. Ajmal, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I, I would love to tell you that a college from Tamil Nadu uh, has invited me to give a talk on post-colonial studies. I think it's Kamraj College. And they also found me just through um, YouTube. So love to see you here. Uh, Ryan, uh, what are your thoughts on Coke Studio Pakistan? Does the media artifact challenge some of the dominant? I don't know, you know, I'm ambivalent about Coke Studio India and Pakistan. On one hand, I like it because there are some of the things that they have produced uh, in Pakistan, at least, is I love the music and the songs. On the other hand, you know, it comes across as a kind of cultural ambivalence to uh, appropriation to me. You know, I, if I want to listen to, you know, Ataullah Khani Sakhelwi, you know, I would rather listen to him as he presents his music. But if Coke Studio can give them a larger world audience, I am all for it. Um, I just 
kind of am skeptical when these corporations come and appropriate art. Maybe they support it. Maybe young people like it. So I would rather err on the side of, uh, you know, generously speaking, I'm not a purist. So maybe if more people can benefit from it, all power to them. So my email ID uh, is very simple. If you go to my YouTube channel and check the about section, my email is listed there. And it's uh, I can put it here too, but that's the easiest place from where you can find it. That's my email, Dr. Ajma. OK, so let me see if I. Uh, missed any of the questions. What's your opinion about how the people from subaltern groups? Okay, so I think I answered that. Um, Kainat, did I answer all your questions? I will uh, give send you, if you email me, I've listed the email here, then I can send you another list of works uh, that I know of. Uh, and yes, you are right on drawing from um, Gramsci, Foucault, and the subaltern studies group authors. Uh, I would say that, you know, look at some women poets from Pakistan as well. And But I will be able to suggest some new text coming from Pakistan. I'm, I would love to recommend some of my own books as well. But uh, And my forthcoming book, Democratic Criticism, Poetics of Incitement, and the Muslim Sacred would be a good help to you. So. Let me know if you want me to share like the pre-published manuscript with you. Mudassar, I answered your question. Uh, I think, yeah, I think parallel to the dominant national history would be great, right? Anything that can complicate the dominant history. Um, even like small anecdotes. Uh, another thing that is important is to augment our students' learning, OK? Think of it this way. I have one brief video on my channel on Ernest Renan, right, and his idea of nationalism. And of all the people who is interacting with that video are 10th grade students from India. Why? Because in their history textbook, you know, they, they have those blocks of additional information. So somewhere in their history textbook is a small uh, little box of text which mentions Ernest Renan's thoughts on idea of a nation. So these are young kids, right? 10th grade. Where do they go? OK, who was Ernest Renan? They put it in YouTube and pops up my video on Ernest Renan's, you know, what is a nation? And I've heard from a couple of them thanking me for that knowledge, right? So sometimes just juxtaposing additional information in a textbook, which could be from a subaltern group, can, can have that kind of an impact. A few months, uh, yes. Yes, Kainat, the renowned uh, renown Orientalist. Uh, I'm not a fan of his work, but I was doing a series on theories of nationalism. And within that one video that I created was on his how he defines a nation. So that was my context. Otherwise, obviously, I'm not a fan of his work. Akib, what is your stance regarding the genuine moment of Pashtun land, Pashtun Tahafuz movement? Uh, well, I mean, as long as they are fighting for their rights, I, I am for it. You know, I'm not going to give you the official line and say, oh, I don't agree with PTM. I don't care how they argue as long as they are a pacifist movement and as long that they are asking for their rights within the national constitution, all power to them. Same for Balochi people, same for Sindhi people. As a scholar, I can't sit on the sidelines and say these people are not Pakistani enough and these people are Pakistani. No, I believe that if they have certain grievances against the state, they should have the right to openly talk about them and make them an issue in national politics. I will be opposed to it if they you know, picked up arms and rose against the state of Pakistan. That is something violence I cannot support. But any peaceful activism, 
for any community to fight for its right is absolutely within the subaltern. And as a leftist and socialist, of course, I'm for it. Okay, I hope I answered you that question. Uh, good, Akib. So the best way for you to create a response from them is to tell their story, right? Write about it, blog about it. You know, you don't need me to tell that story. You can come to me in solidarity and say, these are the thoughts I have said. What do you think about it? Right. But no one is stopping you from writing about it, from telling their story, from challenging any official narratives. That's how, as I said, living nations become stronger. Human beings, human civilization gets better when we hear each other out. When you, when you um, block critical thought and stop people from speaking about their grievances, what you are then telling them is that the only alternative is something more extreme, right? Um, smarter thing for people in power in Pakistan would be to listen to the PTM young people, you know, to talk to them and say, what difference does it make if someone criticizes a person or an institution? Why should institutions be so fragile that they can't take a little bit of criticism? Right? All these things that we follow in Pakistan, Tohine Adalat, and all that, these are colonial legacies, right? In the United States, even in Britain, there is no law that now tells you you can't say anything about justices, right? That law was made during the time of the British rule, and we still follow it. Similarly, criticizing national institutions, this and that, these were colonial laws. We have still maintained it because they enable the people in power to stay in power and to curb criticism. So any movement that fights for its rights in the streets through peaceful means, right, is worthy of my respect, right? and should be worthy of anyone's respect. All right. And I can tell you, even for saying this, some of my friends from my former professions would be really mad at me, right? I don't know why, but they will be. And there is no way you can't please everyone. Um, as a scholar, student, and a teacher, my job is to speak as far as possible the truth as I know it and understand it. And to speak in solidarity with any constituency that is facing injustice, that is facing silencing, that is failing, facing ostracization. So subaltern groups within Pakistan, within India, rest of the world, wherever they are, fighting for their rights peacefully. You know, I'm always in support of them. Is there any difference between leftist writing with us, sir? Good question. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. What do you mean by leftist writing? I mean, there are different kinds of lefts, right? There is the Trot Trotskyite left, Leninist left. Uh, my left is the workerist left, uh, which comes from Italy. You know, people like uh, Franco Berardi and uh, Carlo Barcelone and all that. So West itself is not a monolithic movement, right? Uh, there is a difference, you know, the early subaltern studies was led by Marxists. Eventually, when they start using Foucault and Derrida, they become slightly culturalists, and that's what they are critiqued for. Uh, so the difference would be of methodology, right, and emphasis on culture or politics. The aim is the same, right? The aim is to tell the stories of subaltern groups to recover the histories of subaltern groups. Method doesn't matter, right? For as long as they are trying to reach the same edge. So you can come from a culturalist pr perspective and do that, or you can come from a leftist materialist pr perspective and still be true to, to the practice. And the practice is to tell the stories of, you know, um, subalternized groups, as long as we are doing that. And, and it's not that we get it right, no. The idea is to juxtapose one story against the mainstream narrative and say, well, OK, you are saying this is what happened, but this is also part of our history. Can we complicate it? Um, let me give you an example before I get, what will you say about? 
uh, I'll come back to your question in a minute, but I was going to go on a side. Uh, Okay, so I'll I'll come back to your question, Mohammed, in a minute. But let me say, uh, how do you like small example? Now you have read your Iqbal, you've read your history of um, India, right? Uh, even Iqbal calls uh, Mahmud Ghaznavi Butshikan, and he's proud of that, right? Now, how do we complicate that picture? What is the historical event that Iqbal is valorizing, and all the other Molvis valorize that? When in the last hamla on India in the 17th, when the when the Rajputs, my ancestors, are defeated, right? Uh, Mahmud of Ghazna destroys this idol, right? The question to juxtapose against that is: Did he have a right to do that as a Muslim ruler? Absolutely not. If he has conquered a territory, right? People have surrendered. Then to respect their way of life and their religion and their practices of religion was his responsibility, okay? And there is historical precedence for that. When, when Omar ibn Abdul Aziz enters Jerusalem, right? Uh, the Jewish elders ask him, come and pray in our temple. And he says, no, and this is part of historical record. It's written in that history that I have over there of Al-Tabari. He refuses to do so. And the reason he refuses to do so is because he says, if I prayed over here, my people will rip apart your temple and build a mosque over here, right? So, so that is subaltern historiography or telling the story of how did the Hindus feel at that time? Right? Why? How would have they felt? Right? How would have they seen these invasions? Right? So, how did I learn of that? Okay, I'm a Rajput. Right? My ancestors were Hindu. I mean, I'm a secular humanist. But okay, cool. All my life, I read histories that valorize these Western in, uh, that these invaders from the you know. From Afghanistan and others, they were my heroes. Sher Shah Suri was my hero, and you know, all Ahmad Shah Abdali was my hero. And then when I started researching about my own ethnic culture, I realized, well, my people, Sultan Sarang, fought against Sher Shah Suri, you know, was killed by Sher Shah Suri. These are my people. Then I went and read about the Rajput traditions. How did they fight against Shohabuddin Ghori and others? And I realized this is also a heritage that I need to claim against that history that has overwritten my own. Does it make me a bad Pakistani? No. Does it make me a better humanist? Absolutely. Knowing my own culture, does it make me, made me disloyal to Pakistan or no? What it made me appreciate was that I come from a deeply complex culture that, you know, that like five generations back, my ancestors were Hindu. Where did they come from? They were Rajputs. They moved from Rajasthan to Jammu, right? So our great, great, great grand grandfather, his name was Raja Nag Khan, right? That's why we're called the Nagyal Rajputs. Four of his sons came down and established four villages in Portohar, which are still extant, right? That's my heritage. And somewhere in 16th century, 17th century, they became Muslims, right? Now, histori historically speaking, for me to go and retrieve that history and teach it to my nephews and nieces doesn't enervate their Muslimhood or whatever. What it tells them is that they have a greater history to connect to, and maybe then, Elsewhere, somewhere else in the world, when they meet a Hindu, their view of that person would not be mediated through that sanctified history in which Hindus are always terrible people, right? But rather, they would look at that person and say, which part of India are you from? Like even now, when I talk to someone and they tell me we are from Rajasthan, right? My response is, that is where my ancestors came from, right? That's a beautiful thing to know our own history. Um, if you look at Pakistani historiography or cultural knowledge, right? Almost all the major ethnic groups claim their past history, right? Official history doesn't, but there is nothing wrong with it. Okay, so 
Usma, I will come to your question. Uh, your, sorry, it was a long journey into this tangent. Uh, how can next generation confirm the veracity of textual substance written by different author? Good point. Okay, so like, how do you do that? I mean, this is what we teach our students, okay? The habit of critical reading. And what is that? Anytime you enter a text and you start reading it, ask yourself, where is this person coming from? You know, when I, what I teach in my literary theory class to my students is not just what theories are, but to immediately know, first of all, is this person a Marxist? Is this person a feminist? Because knowing that tells you which frame of reference that person is using. So part of it is critically looking at a text and asking yourself, where is this person coming from? If you do a little bit of research about the author, especially if it's a journalist, read their previous work, you can already tell their biases, right? So what that teaches you then is what account of that history is mediated through the ideology that that person is in, right? That's the first step. Where is the author coming from, right? Then you can go and look up other sources on the same topic. See, evaluate those sources. It can't be just a blog by a 12-year-old somewhere in the world. I mean, it has to be like something that is credible, right? And then you have another resource. You also have to find out what their prejudices and preferences are. So overall, even a comparison would not just be comparison of content, but also comparison of who has written it what are their own politics and preferences? All of this will bear upon you understanding a historical fact differently, right? As I just pointed out, right, about uh, the Salahuddin Ayyub, or I keep saying Salahuddin, Mahmoud of Ghazna's Satra Hamle, India Cooper. In all Muslim <laughs> Pakistani history textbooks, those are valorized, right? Then we are supposed to love Mahmoud of Ghazna, right? And uh, we have never, ever thought of those 17 invasions from the point of view of the people who were being invaded. Did they deserve to be invaded? Why was Mahmoud of Ghazni coming to India? Because India was a rich part of the world. There was a lot of loot and plunder there. Right? I remember the first time when I word, read the word loot and plunder, in that context was in an English history book, I was shocked, right? Because to me, like, oh my God, Mahmoud of Ghazna was this Muslim hero, right? But that jarring shock made me think about his acts. And then I realized history is what the victors tell us, but a better history is to also look at it from the point of view of the vanquished. What happened to the people? And then when I connected it to the history of my own ethnic group and I realized my people were the one being attacked, right? They were the ones who were fighting uh, against this. And what, what did it give me then? A better understanding of history, a more compassionate view of what otherwise would have been my others, right? People whom I would have vilified and not liked even without knowing a single one of them. And that is, I think, the tragedy of Pakistani historiography. I have talked to people from Bangladesh. One of them actually is my student right now. My first PhD candidate was from Ahmedabad, right? She wrote a wonderful dissertation. What I've learned through these experiences, especially in the context of India and Pakistan, is that we have so many shared cultural metaphors cultural experience, the way we tell our jokes. And this even goes to South of India, not just Northern India. The way we talk to each other, they go, uh, when, when an Indian student writes to me an email, right? if I could share it with you, it's exactly the way Pakistani students, they always call me sir, right? On Facebook, they always call me sir. It's because we both come from the same colonial heritage where we were taught to do that, right? So many other things, the jokes that we tell, the songs that we dance to, the songs that make us cry, right? Are the same. So if we have to build differences, 
built in distrust and hate, those are built on very flimsy grounds. If we really try to build bridges and to get to know each other better and to love each other, we have more substantial historical and cultural foundation for that, right? So as a scholar, I mean, you all know, I mean, there is, I don't have any power or anything, but as a scholar, where do I stand on? I would, I stand on the first stance of Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, right? What was he looking for? Not for a separate country. What he was looking for was a confederacy, right? Muslim majority areas formed their own government. Hindu majority areas formed their own government. And Muslims, the fear of minoritization have parity in the, in the Lok Sabha. Right, that was his basic claim. So if we are really daring together and thinking the future, I would say 10 years down the road, despite Mr. Modi and all the other nationalists on our side, let's sit together as people and say, can we build a coalition in which three or four nations come together and have this large identity as a confederacy? Think of the power of that in the world. Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka coming together and saying, hey, you know, let's sit together and build this dream world, right? Look at the power of that, right? Now, as, a, as an intellectual, is it a taboo subject? Probably. But if I am going to think critically as a scholar, why would I think that is possible, right? Why not think the impossible? and work towards that, how the world has changed because people thought the impossible, right? Civil rights movements here, right? We are Amb uh, uh, Ambedkar in India, right? Thinking of the Dalit rights. I mean, he's the one who wrote the Indian constitution, right? Um, people in Pakistan, Adi Saab, right? If you look at the life of Mr. Adi, he started with 50 pesos. And by the time he passed away, he had created an organization which has taken care of millions of people. These are the people who thought the impossible and made it happen. So if we are going to dare to think, then there would be no subalterns, right? Because they'll be included in our hearts and in our national, regional narratives, right? And no one would be told you are less than me and less than those and less than the other, because ultimately we are all human. So I am going to stop here. Um, I don't see any new questions, but you know, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I know it's a Saturday and it's too early for most of us here, but for you, it's a Saturday evening. Uh, but I am delighted to have you here. I'm glad that you join me today. And if you have any questions, my email is on the channel. Just go to the about section and send me a message. And next week, please do remember the topic is globalization and in post-colonial studies. And we'll follow the same format. And you can also, using the same email, send me any questions in advance. So once again, Sorry for my ramblings, right? If I have offended any one of you, I do apologize. That is never my intention. Uh, but thank you so much for joining me and I will sign off now. And this will be available as a recorded lecture on my YouTube channel, so you can visit it anytime you want. And please do subscribe. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. God bless you and take care. Khuda Hafiz.